Hello folks and welcome back to English 437 537 with me Dr. Matt Barton. In this lecture we'll be talking about scaling goodness and digital digital PR. <laughs> so it's, for some reason it's hard for me to say the word digital. I have to think about it a little bit. But uh, anyway, here are the learning uh, lecture objectives rather for today. We're learning objectives. Uh, we'll discuss the mutual benefits of companies promoting humanitarian causes in the age of social media. What does that look like now that we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, you name it. Uh, appreciate how PR can tap into social networks, either to monitor, monitor things, list, just listen to customers, learn from them. Uh, appreciate the limits and capacities of various social media models or platforms. So we'll be comparing, you know, what can you do with Facebook versus Twitter uh, versus a blog and so on. Uh, using blogs, Facebook, and Twitter to accomplish strategic communication. And then finally, begin developing a plan for utilizing social media in the event of a crisis. Uh, so it's, let's uh, start off here, as usual, with the Martin book. Uh, she talks about how uh, she's on an airplane and she forgets her iPad and the one of these seat pockets. <laughs> And gets sort of, I guess she doesn't realize this until she's back in the, on the connecting flight or whatever, the layover. And um, sends out a tweet, you know, trying to get some kind of attention from, I think it's United Airways, you know, asking them for help. They don't respond, but some of the, uh, some of the other customers or some of the other uh, passengers do respond. I think one of them even uh, contacts the captain of that or the pilot of the uh, airplane, and he takes the finds the iPad and takes it to her next uh, connection. So it all works out in the end. Uh, but her point is that, you know, this was a U.S. Airways kind of missed the opportunity here. They could have stepped up, you know, saw what was going on and uh, been the ones to publicly come to her assistance. Uh, instead, somebody there was asleep at the wheel. You know, thankfully, that wasn't the pilot. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, it was kind of up to just regular people, other customers, uh, to, to step in there. And even though it was the pilot uh, that carried it, it, it wasn't anything. It wasn't because of United Airways that that happened. It was basically the customers doing what, I guess, uh, uh, the airline should have done. Uh, so she's pointing that out as, like, that's the kind of thing you want to avoid. You know, if you can get out in front of something like this, be seen publicly doing a good job and earning a social kudos, as it were, uh, then when something bad happens, people will be more likely to say, well, you know, but that's a good company. You know, maybe they slipped up here, but, you know, they have a long track record of being helpful. Look, you know, they, uh, one time I left my iPad and they, you know, went <laughs> double hard and they tried doubly uh, to get it back to me. And I really appreciate that. So, you know, keep it to yourself, Twitter hater. <laughs> uh, that's the sort of the idea there. And then uh, Carol gives another view Another story kind of like that with the Las Vegas Hotel. Uh, I guess the guy shows up. It's a huge line. He's probably tired after this long flight or whatever. Same sort of situation, right? Tweets out uh, this hotel that he's trying to stay at. Uh, doesn't respond, but some other hotel responds. And instead of, instead of saying, uh, well, you should come over here <laughs> and go to this other hotel, uh, they just kind of express some, I guess, some... Uh, their feelings, their sympathy for him, and give some tips. So again, it's not, uh, I think Carol's point is that they took that opportunity to kind of soft, to kind of be seen publicly uh, coming to the guy's assistance, not just being uh, selfish about uh, trying to st steal the business of that other hotel. Uh, then he, uh, this is Carol again, I just kind of, just kind of mixed them a little bit together here because we had some overlapping themes. Uh, but Carol says, disgruntled customers are turning to social media with complaints that were once handled in relative privacy with a desk agent. And I think I told you before, I don't know, maybe I didn't mention it in this class, but there have been studies for a while now of uh, restaurants. And the idea is if somebody's, you know, if you're sitting down to eat a meal at a restaurant and there's a table next to you and the they've that table over there has some kind of problem and they're arguing with the the staff, uh, that it, it sort of, uh, it's been shown that a lot of people won't go back to that restaurant, you know, if they have to sit and listen to this argument. Uh, it doesn't really matter how it's resolved or what, uh, they just, it creates kind of a negative 
feeling uh, in these other customers. So they really try to, uh, if the restaurant management guides uh, stress, you know, just try to get this thing resolved as quickly as possible because every minute of this <laughs> tension <laughs> is uh, going to hurt your business maybe permanently. So it's like that concept, but now it's magnified a hundredfold because now they're on Twitter making these complaints and people see that. And even if they, uh, if they agree, disagree with it, you know, how it's resolved or whatever, you know, the fact is, is this is now even more public than it was before. So it's a real concern. And Carol talks about how uh, Del, or maybe it's Martin. I'm pretty sure it's Carol, though. I'm getting my stories confused. But a lot of these companies will have uh, algorithms and people dedicated just to you know, stay on Twitter, see if the name of the restaurant comes up, see if Delta, if somebody types in Delta sucks, <laughs> uh, we need to get in front of that and figure out what's going on and try to, to handle that quickly because it's no longer just a private uh, matter. You know, I'm pretty sure, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, uh, but I notice uh, this has happened to me a few times. I'll be in a restaurant eating or at a business, and I i don't usually complain, uh, but I might just say something like, I, uh, you know, like the food, or I like this, or I remember it was a <laughs> pizza ranch. <laughs> uh, I was eating there one time when they had these new uh, chocolate dessert pizzas, and I, like, took a, made a tweet, and I mentioned Pizza Ranch, and it was like, I love the chocolate pizza. And it was like almost within seconds, somebody from there had responded to that and was like, oh, thank you. You know, we, we do the, uh, we're so happy to hear this, you know. So, I mean, somebody was like right there on top of that. Uh, so it is something that, you know, again, it's one of those places where you might be able to get a job if you're good at social media. Uh, you could be one of the people that, you know, scans for these, uh, Oh, look, look, there's somebody tweeting about our restaurant. Let's go in and see what, see what is being said. Think about how to handle this. And it has to be quick, right? Okay, let's uh, step back for a minute then. Here's your first question. Uh, so take a minute to look at this article here. It's a very brief article. It's mostly an infographic, really. Uh, it's called A Tale of Two Apologies. Southwest versus United Airlines. Uh, Richard Carafel. So it's basically talking about two different apologies from these two different companies and the way they uh, made those apologies on you know and, uh, publicly what was the reaction as I think about these apologies and in, in light of what we've been reading in the Martin book remember we, we talked about apologies before uh, and see if you can link it somehow to this idea of the high positive customer sentiment and respected social media strategies as thinking about all that and the impact that it had on the bottom line uh, for these two companies so just take a minute have some fun with that and then uh, we'll come back and continue. All right, so let's see. Moving on along. Now, so here she's talking about good PR. I might be in the, in the uh, Carol book at this point. Uh, but who is this? <laughs> I think this is still the Martin book, sorry. As it says, that what brands like Virgin and Southwest understand is that social media is ultimately the bridge that permanently links business, future, business ventures and humanitarian ones, making doing business and doing good one and the same. Uh, so here we're talking about these companies that want to stress like how green they are, or how uh, you know how responsive they are in the wake of a tragedy, uh, the, these sorts of things. Uh, they want to basically look good. They want our, people to really respect that brand and, and feel good about doing business with that company. Uh, they don't want to be seen as just greedy. Uh, faceless Borg like you know, profits are the only thing that matter uh, we don't care about the environment you know they, they're trying to get as far away from that kind of view as they can and try to bring on this more positive image uh, so she says the companies have long done these this work I was thinking a lot you know it's almost a cliche right you go to the your high school the grade school uh, there's always like the grocery store, local grocery store chain will sponsor the uniforms, <laughs> maybe the band instruments. You know, so there's a long, this, I mean, companies have been doing business, have, businesses have been doing this forever. Uh, but the fact that there's now this social media component adds an interesting dimension to it, right? Because now it's not just the local customers. You know, the people at that game might see their kids in this <laughs> Coburn's uniforms. <laughs> uh, but now this might be on Twitter, it might be on Facebook, you know, it might reach a much broader audience. And, um, yes, yeah, so it will have more impact on the bottom line. 
She says, if you say you care, you will listen, remain engaged, and constantly strive for stronger relationships with your audience. So there, you know, that's just talking about the Pizza Ranch example. You know, you can say what you want. I don't know anything about Pizza Ranch, who runs that or what, whatever. Uh, but just from that little interaction, I, I know they must have somebody. They care enough to have somebody there monitoring their Twitter feeds and ready to respond quickly. You know, and it was was not just an automated response. You know, I could tell they, you know, they mentioned like the chocolate pizza in there. <laughs> uh, now, did it make a stronger relationship with me? You know, maybe. You know, you feel like, I do feel like I kind of have some connection. I have a story to tell you know, <laughs> about, about a Twitter response from uh, Pizza Ranch. So, you know, in that sense, maybe we do have the start of a beautiful <laughs> relationship. Uh, okay. Uh, so then they... Let's see, she's talking about the humanity. Maybe that's me to put that slide there. Uh, but I thought this was an interesting point. Uh, so she's talking about this promotional campaign. She's been brought in basically as a PR person, right? Try to get some marketing, advertising, get the word out about this. I think was, at this point it was an NHL team or a couple of NHL events between two teams. And so she's trying to promote this. And the idea was to bring this charitable cause into it. Uh, because the reasoning was that even if people don't necessarily care about the NHL or you know care about hockey at all, uh, much less these individual teams, maybe if they see that link to the charitable organization, then they'll say, "Oh, that's you know they're trying to do some good. Uh, I feel pretty good about liking this post or spreading this." You know, some people call that sort of thing slacktivism. <laughs> you know, the argument is if you. If you, if you like something like that on Facebook, then somehow you already feel like you've done your part, <laughs> even though you haven't actually donated any money, uh, much less gone out and volunteered for something. So there is that, uh, there's, there's a counter argument to be made here. Uh, but nevertheless, it seemed to work out well for her. And I have an example here, you know, somebody who, I, I like uh, guitars, and I was looking for this, like, charitable causes in the news, and I came across this example from Gibson. So a little bit more recent. Let's see if I can get that on the... Uh, there we go. Uh, so this is on Facebook. And what they've done... Let me zoom in here. So you probably... I don't know when you'll be watching this, but there's recently was some uh, tornadoes, I believe, in Tennessee. And a lot of the... Uh, you know, the houses were destroyed along, of course, with the musical instruments. That You know, Nashville's a very uh, musically uh, prominent place, I suppose. So this Gibson Guitar Company, these guitars are about $4,000. Uh, at least that's uh, some of the higher-end brands. Uh, but what they did, let's just see what if they specify it here. So if one way that Gibson will provide immediate help is to give a guitar to any musician who had the guitar damaged or destroyed by the recent Tennessee tornado. So if you or someone you know lost their guitar, you can go to this Gibson Gifts dot site and maybe get a you know a free guitar replacement. And as I said, this is a pretty big deal because some of these guitars are up in the like four thousand dollar range. That's the only way they did this, made this move, and you can see they made this public. And you know they probably could have just privately gone in and like looked at their customer database, found out who's from this area. Uh, but they chose to make this public. Obviously, part of this is, well, they probably do want to help and do their part, right? But uh, there's also a lot of good PR uh, that goes with a move like this. <clears throat> makes people think, well, you know, $4,000 is a lot of money for a guitar, you know. But, but then on the other hand, it's such a good company. They're giving these guitars to these you know, poor folks who've had their uh, lives ruined. At least they have a, their guitar back. And if you look at these uh, comments here, you can see a lot of the public sentiment seems to be uh, positive, right? Here's here's a Brad Schlitz. This is awesome of you guys. Uh, Kathy Biss Bates. Nice job, Gibson. Love this. Uh, here's one is this one. Seems fake. Anybody can say they lost a guitar. So, you know, you're going to always get the James Herdens. <laughs> there's one in every class. There's one in every Facebook thread, right? Somebody trying to find something negative. Uh, to say, or at least questioning it. Let's see, here's one that mentions the bottom line. Gibson gives when it's beneficial to their bottom line, but all those firebirds would have been too generous to rebrand and give to schools that can't afford new instruments. Uh, so not, that sounds like some kind of negative comment. I'm not sure what it means. Uh, but anyway, you get the idea, right? This is something 
you know, again, it's part about this just being timely with it. Nobody would care if this was, uh, you know, two or three weeks from now, but they, they sort of want to ride the news wave. Uh, all the folks talking about these, uh, uh, the tornadoes, you know, and you can get in on that, basically get some PR and do some good. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Letting employees tweet on behalf of a company. So this is something that Martin and Carol talk about, which, you know, those are the parts I really want you to focus in on because, you know, as, as I've said, if you see the same thing in a couple different sources, it must mean it's important. Uh, so the idea is if you're the manager or you own the company, do you want your just run-of-the-mill run uh, employees tweeting or blogging uh, you know, or engaging in social media on behalf of the company? You know, so it's one thing if they're if this is like their personal Twitter feed, even though as we've seen, there's reasons to ban that as well. Uh, but you know, like take St. Cloud State, Did it, should SCSU just let all the professors and uh, TAs and whatever just tweet about you know tweet as though they're representing the university in some kind of official capacity? And both of these authors pretty much say yes. You know, you should should definitely let that happen. You should have some parameters around it, but it's more damaging not to do it. Uh, than, than the risk of a disgruntled person coming out and saying something negative. Uh, so she says, uh, this is Martin, I think. Now, many employers fear what might happen if employees have too much freedom and tighten the control. Right? Muzzle, <laughs> muzzle that account. But she says, guess what? The customers can tell. Right? So there's, you know, if it seems eerily silent, uh, they're going to say, no, something doesn't seem quite right about this company. I like this line too. Suffocated employees don't usually make good impressions on customers. No, I don't think they do. <laughs> you know, if you if you see all this stuff about, uh, you know, I sometimes think that, you know, some of these managers at these businesses, they don't really think at all about like the customers coming into my business and like seeing signs on the walls and like stuff that this is ostensibly there for the employees. But of course, you're, the, you're standing there in line. What else are you going to do? You're going to be looking down and reading like the signs. <laughs> just, just at Dollar Tree, there was like some stuff, some signs on the cash registers for the uh, uh, the cashiers there. You know, it wasn't anything negative, but I could imagine like, <laughs> stay off Facebook. <laughs> do not tweet. <laughs> you think, hmm, well, something's going on here. Uh, it would make a bad impression. Yeah, and here's the Carol. He talks more about this in the context of employee blogging. Uh, it's kind of funny. He says, well, Sun is the best example. And they really were. I got online and like typed in Sun employee blogging and all these articles about how great this is and how it's, you know, being so good for Sun. But <laughs> sadly, Sun is gone, kaput. Uh, they were bought out, I believe, by Oracle. And I looked at Oracle. They seem to be keeping the blogs but it's no longer at least as far as i could tell not employee driven i think they've hired a team to do it instead uh, so you know take that with a grain of salt i suppose uh, but he, he's uh, let's see carol here is saying individual employees should make it clear they're expressing their own views and not those of their employer and they should identify themselves including their role or title with the company uh, so like i say sun is down the sun is down <laughs> <laughs> Never to rise again. Uh, but we do have Nokia. It took me a while. I was trying to find some employee blogs, and I came across Nokia was one of the ones that seems about the most legit. Uh, so they've got these, what they call vlogs. Love this one. Hi, I'm Annie. Let me show you a typical working day for me here in Helsinki. So let's go. Okay, so this seems pretty well done, right? They've got some video videographers out there, some camera people. They talk a little bit about themselves. And if we scroll on down, uh, we can see life at Nokia Blogs. Uh, so this, you know, this company is probably the, the modern version of Sun. They seem to have carried on that tradition. Now, I was, I didn't click through all of these. But I was curious if they allow, like, negative stuff. <laughs> You know, somebody got on here. I hated it here. My boss was a jerk. You know, I didn't uh, see anything negative on any of these. So that's a little bit, you know, perhaps a little bit troubling. And plus there's not, they call this a blog, but uh, 
you know, all I see is like the one post uh, for everybody, right? Let's just try it somebody else. So we got the video blogs, life at Nokia blogs. So like I said, I was not able to find, these seem just kind of like one-off deals. Whereas the Sun, at Sun Microsystems, my understanding was that that, that was like an ongoing thing. Like every month they would come back and post something. And yeah, world's problems. So I don't know what you think about this. Oh, here's an Instagram. Uh, but this to me just looks like they've hired some people, maybe worked with these folks to present this, you know, overwhelmingly positive uh, employee blog stuff. So they wanted it to kind of look like a blog. <laughs> it's really, uh, to me, it looks a little bit too, uh, you know, too contrived. But I think that was what they were going for. By, you know, why did they call it employee blogs? You know, they could have called it something else. Uh, fight the powers that tweet. Uh, so she is here. And if anything, I, I think some of the criticisms of this book, and some, you know, some of you have mentioned this in your nuggets as well. You know, maybe Martin is, uh, what's the phrase, uh, like the rose-colored glasses on, you know, being a little too optimistic, <clears throat> maybe even <clears throat> a little bit naive, you know, about the potential of some of these, uh, uh, some of the stuff she's talking about. I mean, she talks here, this is on page 170, how renegades embrace their power and lead it into a force for scaling goodness and good business and then share the benefits with humanity. <laughs> it's, it's like, woohoo! You know, it's, it's just very positive. It seems, uh, you know, like she's, she's never met a Twitter user she didn't like. Right? It's kind of like the Will Rogers approach <laughs> social media. Uh, whereas, you know, if you turn on the news, there's, there's, you'll, you'll frequently come across stories, you know, people talking about it. I don't even really know what this article is. I just I just typed in like Twitter mob and like thousands of things pop up in the you know about these these folks on Twitter and like they're always trying to get stuff shut down or uh, shows canceled and things. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, just terrible people on Twitter. You know, it's not like it's just all good. And some of the loudest voices, unfortunately, are some of the most toxic voices. Uh, so there is a downside, I think, a potential. Uh, you know, nasty side to all this. I uh, said, so, well, let's uh, look at a study quick on this, or, or I think related to this. So Pew, I mentioned them last time. Uh, they got a study here called Sizing Up Twitter Users. Uh, so it's kind of some just some demographics about the typical people that use Twitter, you know, how they break down uh, politically and so on. I was actually kind of surprised by it, to be honest with you. Uh, so take a look at that, see what you think about those stats. And then uh, what do you think? Do you think this, you know, knowing that, do you feel like uh, Martin's right? You know, it, uh, to claim, here's a claim, power is rapidly shifting to the hands, or should we say the fingers, of the masses, and it's trending positive. So she's saying that, you know, I guess more and more just regular folks are using Twitter, and they're good people. You know, that's her take. Uh, but you've got the Pew Research Study there. You know, see what you think. You know, see if you can come up with about 100 words on that. All right, so we're definitely into the Carol book here because we're getting these nice uh, lists of tips. <laughs> you know, the thing about Carol, he does practice what he preaches. You know, he, he said that we should have more lists and keep things simple, keep things clear. Uh, he definitely does that. Uh, here he's talking about something called a press release. And you might have seen these before. Uh, I get if you do any kind of regular blogging, eventually you'll be contacted by one of these uh, press release or, or PR firms. And basically, you know, a new game. For me, it'll be a new game coming out. Uh, maybe some type of new uh, educational software of some sort. Uh, so you'll get this. Uh, it'll be called like press release colon and then whatever the product is after that. And then basically just a sort of marketing. It's almost it's very close to an advertisement, except it's supposedly more. Uh, it's supposed to look more like a news, like a news item than just a straight up advertisement. So it's a little more informational, I suppose, than a just a straight up ad would be. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, Carol says they need to do, really rethink these. The strategy, you know, is kind of antiquated, obsolete at this point. And so he's got some tips I think are worth looking at. Uh, so the first of these is that just announcing something doesn't make it news. Now, the value isn't in the announcing. So we are thinking uh, lately about this professional communications professional communication program right and we're thinking, <laughs> wanting to put together a press release on that 
Uh, so that would be the thing to think about, right? Like, who cares? Nobody's going to care just that we've got this new program. And just that fact alone, zero interest. So you have to think a little deeper. Uh, so let's see, no one cares who is making the announcement or that person's title. So again, oh, this is Dr. Barton, a professor at St. Cloud State. You know, yawn. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> A lead instead with the news or information that people will care about. Uh, so for that, we wanted to stress that it was uh, the first online program. You completely online BA, you know, St. Cloud State. So you don't have to come to the building. <laughs> you just sit at home on your computer and take all the courses you need to get this uh, degree. You know, and that's what people, at least what we feel like people will care more about. A lot, they care about that more than they would uh, the name of the program or the name of the person making the release. Now, let's see what else he says. How excited or proud you are, proud you or your company is about something, isn't news either. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> yeah, nobody cares how proud we are to have this online program and because it doesn't pertain to them. Right? They, people want to know what pertains to me. Uh, alphabet soup is a barrier to understanding, right? So we didn't just keep saying PCOM and using all these acronyms, MCOM, nobody, CMST, no, nobody knows what that is. Uh, avoid empty, cliched claims such as world class solutions, best of breed. <laughs> the, this program is the best of breed, folks. <laughs> uh, it's just people, I think, have a sensitivity to that kind of marketing speak, right? It, World class, this proactive, that and it just kind of turns them off. They don't. It doesn't feel human. It doesn't feel authentic when you're using language like that. And then uh, finally, using uh, the linking intelligently, right? So some of these companies, like the one I was talking about, this PR Newswire, you know, it's just text. There's, there's no. They don't link. Actually, have a link in there to the companies that they're releasing. Maybe they do now, but <laughs> you know, I remember before having to like search out like, where's the website for this company? It's not even listed there. You know, they're still obviously thinking in that print paradigm. All right. I think you're going to have some fun with this question. So there's about a two minute long video there uh, that Carol points out. It's a satire of these uh, PR videos. I, I thought it was hilarious. <laughs> it's a little bit edgy, maybe. <laughs> uh, but anyway, think about this. Now, I love teaching with satire and parody because, uh, yes, it's funny, it's entertaining, but really, if you think about it, there's a lot of uh, the fact that if, if, it, if it is funny, that means it's working, that means it's, it's getting at something uh, that we kind of know deep down is wrong or silly or maybe mistakes that we have made before. Uh, so there's a lot to learn from uh, just, you know, just because something is satirical or parody doesn't mean there's nothing to learn from it. It's basically my point. Uh, so look at that video and think about what does it reveal to you about maybe some of your thinking about good PR, or bad PR, uh, some cliches. Uh, you know, see if you can tie this into what Carol and Martin have been talking about. Uh, and again, about 100 words on that. All right, so it gave us the don't do list. This is the to do list or questions to consider as you're crafting your materials. Uh, so one, what is the purpose of this release, right? What is the news? Is there any news there? Uh, two, who is the audience or public for this message? I mean, that is the classic rhetorical question. Who is the audience? What do you know about your audience? What do they care about? That's what you have to think about. Yet it doesn't really matter, you know, what's best for the company. You know, always uh, this is something that comes up again and again in 332 around the resumes and the book proposals and things because uh, it, it doesn't really matter you know you can really tell when somebody is only thinking about what's good for them and like what's exciting for them uh, but they're not giving any thought to like this is a person the audience is the person who represents this company right? it's a business and they want to make money uh, or it's a you know an organization and they're trying to increase their reach you know so they, they've got different uh, it's a very different set of values there or goals and you really have to be, if you can't be mindful of the audience, you're just never going to get anywhere uh, with uh, any kind of, not just public relations, but really just being an effective communicator at all. And it's uh, sadly something that you really have to just hammer into people because we are just so focused on like this, me, 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 I, I. <laughs> like, okay, but 
now you got to think about the other person. What? Uh, three, why should this audience care? How will it benefit them? You know, when we're doing culminating, uh, pro uh, when we're in graduate classes, uh, we call this the so what question, right? So you want to do this research, fine, but who cares about it? Who besides you should care about this, right? What is the, is there any kind of benefit to a broader audience uh, than just yourself, right? Or just that company? Uh, four, what is the communica communicative goal of your organization? How does this release fit into a larger purpose or strategy? You know, you probably have some bigger campaign, some bigger objectives in sight. What are the key points of that uh, press release? And then why now? Why are you doing this now? You know, the Gibson one we were looking at earlier, I guess you could call that a press release. You know, obviously the why now would be that because these people have just lost their probably the, their, maybe even their whole entire possessions, right? <laughs> much less a <their> guitar. <laughs> and so it makes sense to do this now uh, rather than wait, you know, a long time and after the, the buzz is, is down, but also other, you know, maybe they've recovered or moved or whatever. And so they really need to act quickly. Uh, earning mentions. Uh, so I think I like key insight here as well. So they're talking here, or uh, Carol's talking here about the, uh, this idea of earned media versus paid media. <laughs> so, so last time we were looking at people who were basically saying, you know, I will pay you uh, to tweet about me and talk about how great I am or my company is or whatever. Uh, but the problem with that is just kind of like television commercials, advertising. It's, people are extremely skeptical of it. They see it for what it is. It's not going to be convincing. Uh, whereas if it's your grandpa or your friends or your teachers or somebody that you know well and respect, you know, if they're telling you this is good, uh, you'd be a lot more likely uh, to take it seriously. Uh, so that's really the, the key. And they, that's just word of mouth advertising is what that's been called. And so he starts off by saying it's still about that. It's just that the what word of mouth looks like has changed. Um, and so he's, how do you get the word of mouth going? Basically, how do you just get regular people talking about it instead of uh, just advertising it? And I think he's, he's, I think he's dead on the money here. Uh, so really what it is, we're increasingly doing, the PR people, are increasingly doing what is essentially journalism. And the perspectives on providing their publics with information are often those of a publisher. So in a sense... You know, we like to think about, well, journalism's over here, publishing is over here, PR is over here. It's like these very different buckets, you know, very different offices. Uh, whereas what we, sort of one of the themes in this course is really the, these people are kind of doing everything now. It's a little bit of everything. So it really doesn't make even make much sense to really try to say, well, the you know, this doesn't have anything to do with journalism. This doesn't have anything to do with that. You know, that you got to get, <laughs> you need to kind of evolve out of that really rigid uh, <clears throat> those categories. Uh, three, they provide a large bureaucratic institution with a with several thoroughly human, even heroic faces. Right, so that sounds very familiar from our Martin book. Uh, you just have to overcome the fears, learn by doing. And so he talks about uh, Boeing. Yeah, so here's a question for us. Instead of having me talk about this, uh, take a look. There's a tweet there uh, from one of the uh, Boeing videos that he was talking about uh, so that you know again but they're trying to make this you know sort of intangible thing boeing making aircraft you know it's it's kind of over a lot of people's heads basically <laughs> uh, but trying to like bring that down to earth uh, so to speak uh, so people can get a sense of what this company is like the sort of the people putting the people in front of the uh, you know the machinery or the the computers you know the technologies involved put this human face on it. Let's take a look at that tweet and the video, maybe look at some of the comments on it, uh, and then see see if you agree with Carol and uh, Martin. Uh, do you think this more, first of all, do you think this is a more people-focused approach? And then does it really, does it seem more like journalism? Or does it seem like purely PR? Or is it maybe those, maybe that's kind of blurring a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit of both. <laughs> uh, but anyway, you tell me. Uh, and then does it seem thoroughly human? Does it seem authentic? Maybe even heroic would be the goal. So again, see if you can spend about 100 words on that, and then I will move forward.
All right, so here he's going to talk about blogs, Twitter, and then Facebook. Uh, so when you're using blogs, uh, he starts by giving us 1,500 words is the sweet spot, uh, which before the word the 300 word, I can't remember if that was at Martin, uh, but anyway, I remember 300 words came up before. So he's saying and the 300 words, you know, if that's that's like the bare minimum where it will be picked up by Google. And so anything shorter than that, if, you're, if it, you can't even really call it a blog, you know, it's not going to get indexed anywhere. It's basically just a waste of time. Really, if it's going to be that that few, uh, you might want to start thinking about Twitter or a micro blogging instead. Uh, but really, a good beefy blog will be about 1,500 words is what you want to shoot for. So I'm trying to think about that in terms of pages. It's probably about four or five pages, double space, maybe a little more than that. It was like 350 words per page, double spaced. Uh, so somewhere around that ballpark anyway. Uh, but if you get the 1,500 words and you've done a good job writing it with a proper intro, body, and conclusion, and all that good stuff, uh, there's a fairly good chance it will get some attention, get picked up on Google or within the uh, the blogging community you're part of. Uh, so that's a good figure to be shooting for. Try to get the, a feeling for what 1,500 words feels like, and uh, you'll be good to go. Let's see, the best blogs are actually useful. <laughs> Who knew? <laughs> And they open up a window into the humanity of, of an organization. Uh, a byline is essential. And so this last bit here, you know, one of the things I noticed, uh, some of those employee blogs I was looking at, they called them employee blogs, but they would just they would be authored by something like uh, you know, the company uh, social media editors. And like it didn't have a name there, uh, just kind of like they didn't want to put their name on it. <laughs> It <laughs> just kind of use a company name instead or a team name instead it wasn't really uh, very effective. You know, it, it really seems again like it's just made up, or it's that sort of faceless corporation creeping back into it. Yeah, you know, you could call it a blog, uh, but if it doesn't feel like it's written by real people who are willing to put their name on it, you know, is it even a blog? You know, it's like you're trying to strip out all the personality from it. it defeats the purpose after a while. Uh, okay, so this was. Uh, uh, I was kind of surprised to see him talk about Walmart's blog. Now, first of all, Walmart has a blog. <laughs> okay, uh, I had to check this out. Uh, so they've got this blog. It's corporatewalmart.com newsroom. This is a corporate blog. Uh, so he's got some tips for corporate blogs. Uh, so let's look at these tips, and then I'll flip over, and we can look at the Walmart blog. Uh, so he says, the better corporate blogs understand the ingredients for building readership and community. So high quality, interesting, engaging content, a recognizably authentic human voice, good writing, timeliness, engagement with readers and stakeholders, shareability or virality, viral, <laughs> things going viral, <laughs> uh, and alignment with corporate objectives. So let's uh, open this up here and see what we think. All right, here we are at the Walmart corporate blog. What's this first item here? Opening doors for women, opening doors for innovation, highlighting women-owned businesses. I wonder if that's a play on words there about opening doors for women that seems to have a bit of a connotation to it. So already I'm a little bit <laughs> worried. Uh, let's see, at Walmart, it's kind of hard to read this. Let's see. At Walmart, we know we are at our best when we champion diversity and inclusion across our business. Women make up the majority of our associates and the majority of our shoppers, so it makes sense for us to use our strength to support women. Uh, so I'm getting a strong like sense of, you know, the values that they're stressing. Let's see if they put a byline on it. Uh, so we have a date, March 6, 2020. So it is, today is actually March 7th. So this is very... You know, yesterday, basically, this was posted. So it kind of ticks that first box. It's recent. And we do have a byline. Andrea Albright, Senior Vice President, Snacks, Beverages, and Impulse. What is <laughs> Beverages and Impulse? <laughs> what is that? Like Impulse Buys? Walmart. Uh, so apparently this is written by a real employee. Uh, this, in this case, a Senior Vice President for Snacks. <laughs> I love this job. Is I'm the vice president of snacks. I would I would be so good at that. 
Uh, let's see, at Walmart, we know we are at our best when we champ. Okay, so that's the same thing there. Let's see if they've got anything like from that sort of makes it feel like it's written by a person. Uh, sure, it's using the first person there. Now, I want to take a moment to highlight a few business owners whose courage and creativity, along with the support of Walmart, have helped bring innovation. All right, so she's got, looks like some photos here. Uh, Helen Lampkin, uh, Desiree Henderson. So she's telling us about what they do. And let's see, does it have a conclusion? Thank you to our women business owners who were boldly courageous enough to follow their passions. Uh, by working with Walmart, each of these businesses had an opportunity to grow their business in a sustainable way and make an impact in the communities we serve. Okay. So I think I'm getting a pretty good sense of this. Uh, just in terms of like the structure of the blog, you know, you notice it does have these sort of bright, colorful photos of people's faces. You can see the emotions. It's got the byline. It's uh, nicely broken up. It's not like these giant paragraphs that just make you want to uh, <laughs> click away instantly. <laughs> it looks like there are some links in here. Uh, so she is using the uh, the hyperlinking, uh, sort of doing the thing with the bulleted lists. Yeah, links and all those. Okay, so you know it is what it is. <laughs> uh, to me, it's uh, let's go back to the list here. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. It's oops. Uh, the writing it looked like it was well edited. It was well organized. It did you know had a proper organization. Uh, the introduction, the conclusion, you know, all that holds together well. I didn't see any errors or anything. Uh, was it interesting and engaging? You know, I mean, at some point that is objective, I su or subjective, I suppose. But, you know, I, I would probably say so. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 I'd probably say it's more informative we're trying to be informative more than just entertaining. Uh, but there was some, uh, you know, if, again, this is probably not a blog that I would want to read every day. <laughs> just put it that way. <laughs> uh, did it seem authentic? That's the one that I'm kind of like, I don't know. It did seem very uh, positive, like glowingly positive about Walmart. Uh, so that makes, you know, maybe she just really does love the, the, the company to that extent. Maybe I'm just being cynical. Uh, but, you know, it did use the first person. It didn't seem like it was written by a robot. Uh, you know, so there's that. And let's see, engagement. Actually, I did not. Let's go back to it one minute. Are there comments on? Are there comments on this? Is it like any interaction with a community? What is this thing? How likely are you to recommend Walmart? Is that what they're using instead of comments? <laughs> that? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not seeing a way to like uh, comment on this. Uh, so that's a big negative. I, mean, I don't know what they're doing on their Twitter pages, but yeah, I don't see any way to like respond to that. Uh, sharing, yeah, I did see those links there. I could share it on Twitter or Facebook or whatever. And I, th I think it definitely aligns with the corporate objectives, or at least the ones they, they claim they have. So anyway, that's just kind of a quick and dirty analysis. You could clearly spend some time uh, doing this with any uh, corporate blog. And, you know, sometimes I think it's more helpful to look at ones that aren't done so well, that aren't so slick. Because uh, that way, sometimes it's easier to learn from a sort of mediocre or even bad examples. Uh, they're not as intimidating. And then always just going like straight to the, you know, uh, creme de la creme top 10 bloggers. <laughs> it's uh, sometimes harder to learn that way. All right, anyway, moving on from blogs to Twitter, you know, I think just in general, uh, it does seem to me that a lot of the stuff that people used to do in blogs, a lot of that energy and excitement has now moved away from blogging into Twitter, uh, into Instagram, into, into these other services. So it makes me wonder, uh, but in any case, you definitely want to be savvy with uh, uh, these other ones as well, not just the blogging. <clears throat> All right, uh, here are Carol's tips for using Twitter. Uh, one is he's sort of, uh, you might think old-fashioned, okay, but he says, you know, you ought to use periods, uh, commas, 
put the apostrophes in the right place, use quotation marks, parentheses, you know, so basically be grammatically, uh, grammatically and mechanically correct. Uh, ignore the pressure to be like uh, the, who was it? Uh, uh, Shaq and, <laughs> and The Rock. <laughs> yes, even though they are like have millions and millions of followers using acronyms and not even putting a punctuation anywhere in their post. <laughs> uh, Carol thinks we should be uh, more formal. You know, okay. I mean, uh, he is talking about PR here, so you do have to think about this uh, image you're trying to project. Uh, studies have shown that retweets contain more punctuation than original tweets. Now, I'm just not sure what that means. You know, if you're retweeting, I didn't know, what does that even mean? It's just you're tweeting what's already been tweeted, unless he's talking about like retweeting with a comment uh, where you can, you know, write a, your, a couple lines of your own in front of the uh, tweet you're tweeting. Maybe he's talking about that. Uh, but it, you know, okay, so that take that, you know, if you want to be grammatically and punctu uh, use proper punctuation in your tweets, you've got somebody on your side. <laughs> Carol <laughs> would be, yes, you go. You, know, you put that comma. You use that Oxford comma. Um, many tweets are essentially headlines. That's, uh, you know, that's kind of almost like a little throwaway line in Carol, but that really kind of got my attention and really got me thinking, you know, he's, I think he's right about this. You know, it is a lot like writing a, all the stuff he said about writing good headlines uh, from a few chapters ago. Uh, that really does seem like good advice for Twitter. I mean, that's what all the best uh, Twitter users seem to be doing. It's just like writing out these headlines and they get you to click on the links or uh, want to learn more. Uh, hashtags. Now, this is something, I don't know if we've really talked about this. You know, a lot of people know that if you have a Twitter account or you want to uh, mention somebody in a tweet, you use the at sign. So for me, it's like at Matt Martin. And then whatever you tweet will show up in my feed as a mention or a, a reply. Uh, but the more important thing is called the hashtag. And that's the, a pound sign or number sign. I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, so he says, hashtags are an attempt to aggregate tweets, organize tweets in such a way as to develop or facilitate conversations in a natural or seemingly natural way. Uh, so then he's got some tips about how to use hashtags. So he says, you should use existing ones because they're already out there. You know, people are using these. People are already subscribed to them. Uh, so it's, you basically just be silly not to use it. Uh, however, uh, you want to be careful, you know, make sure if it's like a, I just was, somebody just sort of uh, pointed this out to me. I retweeted something. There was a, uh, you know, there's a Foldit app that uh, people can use. Uh, uh, it's like a puzzle game, but as you're playing this puzzle, you're actually helping out scientists or med medicine somehow. <laughs> kind of hazy on the details, but it's kind of like one of these out, you know, sort of crowdsourced uh, problem solving apps. Uh, where they need a lot of uh, input and feedback. Uh, but anyway, it was basically it was a game, is the way I interpreted this. So I thought, well, you know, I got Mad Chat. A lot of uh, folks are interested in game studies on my Twitter page, our Twitter feed. So I tweeted this thing about this. Uh, it was a coronavirus. It's like help solve the coronavirus with this folded uh, game, puzzle game. And so I retweeted that. And then uh, some folks, uh, or one of the folks, got back in touch with me. He's like, you know, you might want to, take the hashtags out of this. I didn't put them in there. It was the original Twitter page, but it's like the hashtag was the coronavirus. And the idea was that, you know, this is like being, it's just being everywhere now. This, this It's almost like an overdone uh, hashtag. So you're going to get sort of lost. Or I, think, I don't know what his concern was, why he was, he's like, this is getting uh, too many posts in his feed or something. Uh, it doesn't make much sense, but I think the more likely problem would be it's just going to get completely lost in the shuffle uh, with all those other uh, tags being, you know, things being tagged, uh, coronavirus might even. Uh, maybe his concern was uh, maybe that t Twitter might be systematically going out and trying to get rid of tweets that are just trying to ride that bandwagon, as it were, gets get some attention by using this popular hashtag. So I think that's probably more it. I'm still kind of researching what uh, he was talking about. Uh, but anyway, it's just an example there. You know, even if you're retweeting something, you know, look at the hashtag, decide is it appropriate. Maybe you should take it out, change it. Uh, he says, keep it short. 
you know, if you're doing your own and use them sparingly. Uh, so you don't want to try to just, I see this sometimes, these so-called wannabe PR people. So they'll tweet out something and they'll have like 15 hashtags after that. <laughs> uh, let's just take a look at a hashtag. Uh, so I'll go to uh, Twitter here. Let me put it on so you can see. All right, so uh, over here on the right side, uh, let me zoom in here. We have trends for you. So I don't know how it decides this, I guess based on stuff I've liked before. Or maybe these are just popular tweets. It's not quite sure how they decide this. <laughs> just is random. random. <laughs> I don't even have a political tweet. Uh, but anyway, you can see what, what's happening here. They put the pound sign in front of it. What the heck? I don't even know what this is. Let's just ignore this trends for you. I don't know what, what that is. Let's look at some of the actual tweets over here. Uh, so this person, uh, what are your favorite house D and D house rules? But look, if you put, if you look in front of this D and D Dungeons and Dragons, they put a pound sign. It says pound sign D and D. And so what this this is called a hashtag. And if I click on that, this will go to the all the posts. Or I think we could do it by top or the latest tweets. Uh, there's some different categories there, but top or the latest. I don't, I'm not even sure what some of those do. Uh, but you could see within the past hour, this person used it. Uh-oh, looks like the COBOL had gotten to the components pouch again. Hashtag D&D. &D. So if I just wanted to see all the, all the tweets that had something to do with D&D, &D, uh, then I could follow that hashtag. And there's probably a way here. Yeah, right here I can save the search. And I can specify whether I want it anywhere near. I feel like I've done this before. Maybe I'm just having a deja vu. <laughs> uh, so this person down here, look, they've actually done four hashtags. Sasha. She's got hashtag dice, uh, hashtag handmade dice, D&D, uh, T, T, RPG. I keep seeing that diaper Don. I'm like, what, what is that? <laughs> I'm afraid to click on it. Uh, but you get the idea. You might even say this one might be overdoing it. Like, I don't know. What is hashtag dice? You know, I have a hard time believing there's a big... Well, you know, I stand correct. Well, everything dies. Okay, well, there's quite a bit of activity around this dice. Uh hashtag as well. So this is a good way to find, you know, when you're tweeting something, if I was making handmade dice, you know, clearly you'd want to use that hashtag dice in there to get all those people's lists. Now let's see if we could find one about, um, what do we want to look for? Let's try rhetoric and composition. All right, so then we just kind of do this raw search but if we scroll down, hopefully we'll be able to see some hashtags in some of these. I'm not seeing the hashtags. There's a hashtag for an English program. Okay, here's a couple of hashtags. This is a digital divide, digital humanities, and there's a pound sign composition. Let's try the composition. Okay, so this, this seems to be getting closer to where we need to be, right? So what you do, you click on the hashtag, you look and see what kind of posts are showing up. You say, does that actually mean, is this, you know, is are these the posts I'm trying to associate with? Composition, literary leaves. There's a grammar one. So I would have to, it looks like we would need to dig a little bit deeper to find a really good hashtag. Here's composition studies. Maybe that would be more. Maybe that would be better, because you know, none of these are quite right. Let's just take a quick look here at this. Yeah, see, so here's a hashtag for the, this must be the, the new uh, uh, Four C's is the big conference for compositionists, uh, international conference. So they've created this hashtag, uh, hashtag 4C20. And you can see there's a few posts, not a whole lot I'm seeing there, but these are people that I guess are going to this conference. Yeah, a lot of the posts are like, are you planning to attend? 
where are you going and so on i said this would be good if you wanted to uh you know tweet something that you would have a pretty good chance of all the folks that are really serious about this conference would see how you could use that hashtag and so I, I think it's useful just to kind of do a lot of before you commit to one you know just type it in there search for it see what else is being posted i just did role playing you know i could see well this seems to be a lot of miniatures there's a <laughs> uh, okay okay <laughs> random sort of cat videos yeah, there's some more of those dice. A lot of this stuff seems D and D focused, but now that's the idea. You search a couple different hashtags. You decide which one or maybe two that you want to use, uh, and then you can include those in your tweets, and then it'll show up when people do those searches for the hashtag. So it's it's a very useful thing to get in the habit of doing. Uh, don't just tweet something without at least one hashtag. So you wanted to be just be thinking of like where might this tweet fit in, uh, where is the audience for this tweet? See if you could find appropriate hashtags. And you know what I would recommend is once you find one, you know I, I showed you that save the search, or just even just write it down somewhere so you, in case you forget it later you can just sort of get in the habit of using it. All right, some more Twitter tips. Uh, one is the link shortener. That's actually automatic now. So a lot of times you'll copy paste a link and want to put it in a tweet and it'll be this long monstrous link URL. You used to have to like shorten that yourself manually. Uh, now it, it doesn't actually count that as part of your word or character limit anymore. It just automatically snips it for you. Uh, so you don't even really have to bother about that anymore. Uh, some other advice, following people posting similar things. Uh, many will reciprocate. You know, so my advice with this, you know, post a few things on your Twitter page first, just so people can kind of get a sense of uh, your topic and who you are and, and what you're tweeting about, what your interests are, that you're not just a bot. <laughs> you know, fill out the about and, the, you know, upload a picture of some sort. Uh, you, can, you know, not everybody wants to have their actual face on their Twitter. You know, they might, might use a cartoon or just sometimes a, just an image from a movie or something. Uh, actually, I'm fine with that. Uh, to me, it's just something that, Something that's not just, don't just leave it blank. <laughs> Something with a bit of personality, uh, I think is a good idea. Uh, but yeah, once you have set up a little bit, you're replying to other people, you're following their uh, feeds. And you know, when somebody follows me on Twitter, I'm always a little curious, like, who is this person? And so I'll quickly go to their Twitter page and see, uh, you know, are they posting stuff that might be interesting to me? If so, I follow them back, you know, because I want that information. And that's called reciprocation. So they probably, uh, they probably just as happy as I am with that because they follow me, I follow them. You know, we both get uh, the information to expand our audiences. Uh, three, interacting and engaging. You know, that sort of goes without saying. You can't just tweet and not ever read the replies. You know, people love... Uh, you know, especially if somebody's taking the time to tweet out something thoughtful to you. Now, always try to respond in some way. <clears throat> and so you make sure your headshot, blur, bio, and tweets make a good impression. <laughs> uh, yes, that's very important. Uh, some of the, sometimes I won't follow somebody just because their stuff is just so you know, sort of questionable. You know, I know a lot of people love... Uh, and some of you in your tweets have talked about their... <laughs> There's this tendency to like be so political with everything and really divisive. And a lot of people don't want to, they, they might like your content, but they don't want to follow you because they're afraid that somebody else might see that and think, well, you, somehow or another that suggests you uh, agree with their political stuff. Uh, you know, so I would almost advise, you know, I think it'd be a good idea for some people just to have a separate account where they do their political stuff and keep their business stuff separate. Uh, some people though, uh, you know, they don't care. Uh, who is it, Mary Inglebright? <laughs> you know, she does these charming little uh, uh, cartoons and greeting car Hallmark cards kind of art, very uh, sort of old-fashioned art. Uh, but yet her, t her tweets and Facebook stuff is like really political. And so a lot of her fans will see that stuff and be like, you know what, I'm, never gonna, I'm not going to buy your art anymore because I don't agree with your politics. <laughs> She's just like, well, I don't care. <laughs> Uh, you know, so your mileage, you, you decide, I guess, you know, what's important to you. Uh, tweeting often, 
Uh, so they recommend, I don't know if he recommends this, somebody recommended twice a day on that. Like anything beyond that begins to feel like spam. I don't know if that's legit or not because uh, Twitter doesn't just automatically send you stuff, right? You have to log in and uh, it won't, you know, the way that it's set up, it, even if you post like 50 things in one day, uh, those it's not like somebody's going to get flooded with 50 things uh, when they log into Twitter. But, you know, I think it's fairly a good idea just to be thinking about maybe two really good things to post instead of just posting you know, 50 and just whatever you know, random thoughts. Use proper syntax, grammar, and punctuation. Yes, Carol, <laughs> we get it. <laughs> okay, so that's Twitter. Now Facebook. Uh, so he says again, nearly half of all Americans get their news from Facebook. You know, I wonder where they, that must be, I hope that's a Pew study. It'd be kind of funny if they were using Facebook, <laughs> Facebook survey. <laughs> Uh, Facebook interactions are the virtual equivalent of word of mouth. And that's the key insight there. So if you see on if you see your friends advocating something or mentioning something on Facebook, uh, that's almost like you ran into them in the hall and they told you about it, right? It seems a lot more authentic than just an advertisement. <clears throat> All right, Facebook tips. Uh, content three to five times more clicks if Thumbnails of photos of people are included. Thumbnail photos of people are included. Uh, so the Gibson just had a guitar, but if you scroll down into that, uh, you did see some photos. I think the other photo was like a house. You know, maybe they should add some people there with a guitar. <laughs> that would have been more effective. Uh, but anyway, yeah, people will be drawn to faces of people. Uh, people can add comments. You know, so if you see some, sometimes I see this on my friends' posts. Uh, they'll post something political and then they'll put on it uh, no comments or no discussion it's just like uh, it just kind of makes you feel weird seeing something like that uh you kind of like why are you even posting it if you don't want to discuss it it's just a little bit strange so yeah it has some kind of option for people to add the comments uh, like appears at both the top and the bottom of articles so this is just if you have a, a you know if you can position where the like buttons are uh, on your blog post. So if people want to like that blog post, you want to make that easy. And he also says if you put that button near the visual content, you'll get more likes. Uh, so it's pretty uh, good advice there. Sounds like they've done some careful study. He says a like introduces and endorses you to every one of that user's friends. And the average user has 350 friends. So you can see why all these companies are trying so hard to make their Facebook pages uh, uh, cute or funny or clever in some way uh, or informative uh, so people will be more likely to share that and then you, you know, once you see that once you share it or like it uh, then your friends will see it and maybe they will share and like it and it you know creates quickly uh, creates the snowball effect of free advertising all right just quickly this is the facebook uh, facebook.com slash business link uh, there's all kinds of information here uh, so I don't want to go all through this. There's a lot of articles, a lot of, uh, you know, they also talk a lot here, but like there's one about marketing on Instagram, marketing with Messenger. Uh, so just what I would do if I were you, bookmark this page about Facebook for business. You know, and come back to this when you're putting your portfolios together or when you get your job, if you're doing some kind of uh, social media consulting you want to bookmark this and keep an eye on it. Read the, yeah, go ahead, sign up for the newsletter. You know, just kind of get all in with this uh, because you'll get a lot of uh, useful. I mean, yeah, just look at these topics here. Uh, five reasons uh, messaging is taking flight with travelers. You know, stuff like this. You learn about it, and then that'll give you stuff you can talk about in your interviews when you're out on the uh, job search. <laughs> give you top, you know, did you know that? <laughs> Uh, whatever you know you just you learn that stuff keep up to date with it and uh, that'll be more effective you know the problem with a textbook is sadly you know by the time this textbook is published a lot of this information is obsolete uh, so you need something like that uh, that site a site like that will keep you up to date with the latest stuff you know when Facebook changes policies which happens all the time some new app whatever uh, you know it's, it's a good thing uh, to keep matter of fact <laughs> I want to make sure I've bookmarked that Okay, some approaches to engagement. 
so how do you get people to like that post, share it, discuss it? Uh, one, keeping the share options manageable, don't overdo it. And so some people want to have this huge string of like every possible social media thing is like some of the weird ones. Yeah, you, you probably want to have Facebook and Twitter, maybe Instagram. But beyond that, you know, some of these that was like delicious. You know, you see still see that sometimes or Reddit, you know, and things of that sort. Uh, you know, I would just stick. I think he's probably right. Just stick to the one or two that matter most to your audience. And just uh, let them, if, they, if somebody wants to post it somewhere else, they can do that on their own. Now, let history be your guide. Now, what has or hasn't worked previously? Very useful. You know, uh, sometimes I'll go to a YouTube video or something I posted on Twitter, and it's just like, why does this have, like, you know, 100 likes? <laughs> you know, and all this other stuff has, like, two, three. Well, you won't know until you really get in and start looking at the at the uh, the metrics there so if you, see if you can find a pattern you know what is it about these posts that make them is there anything in common the ones that have a lot of uh, likes uh, what about the ones that don't get any likes you know uh, one of the things i have noticed after reading uh, carol and uh, martin just kind of as an experiment and every now and then i'll post something to facebook or twitter and i'll put like a maybe something i find a product or a sign i, I notice if i put my face in there so it's like the product is over here my face is in the photo uh, that will get a lot more likes uh, than if I just show the picture of the product itself so I think people like seeing the expression uh, they like seeing the the human you know nothing special about me <laughs> it's just more interesting to see a person uh, in the photo uh, than just a photo of the product you know so try that out uh, be truthful and transparent no well, that should go without saying if you try to sound like somebody you're not, like all those folks that were doing the Dollar Tree, uh, Howard Stern, <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> this comes across as fake and painful and awkward. Uh, you know, a lot of people all are very awkward when they start off, especially with the video or, or podcasting, something like that. Uh, you just have to work through that. <laughs> you know, eventually it'll get less awkward once you get more comfortable. Uh, adjusting and adapting again you might be changing a uh, refining your topics you know like I started off with the just talking about games in general then adjusted and adapted uh, to focus more on a certain era and genre uh, doing a practice run yeah you know click through it all yourself make sure everything's working you know you just because you put that share button up up on there doesn't that doesn't mean it works you know you got to test that thing out make sure it's working properly uh, and it might work fine on your computer, but maybe your friend uh, doesn't work on their computer. Uh, so try to get a lot of people testing this thing out. Kick the tires, you know, make try different browsers, uh, make sure it's working. All right, some other strategies. You know, this is what I really wanted to zero in on here because you know, I'll, I get asked this all the time. Like, okay, how do I get more people to watch my YouTube? Uh, how do I get more Facebook uh, likes or how do I get more uh, Twitter replies? Uh, how do I get more people to follow me on Twitter, etc.? Uh, so I've I've can bear witness to this. I've seen people use all of these strategies, and there's something to be said for each one of them. Uh, a lot of people think the first thing they think about is the sponsoring something. So they'll, they'll give away a prize. You know, you retweet something or you make a comment about a product, uh, something you like about this or that, and then we'll put you in a drawing for a free copy of a book. Uh, or a, you know, a gift card of some sort. You know, so that seems to work for a lot of people. Uh, asking questions, uh, responding quickly and meaningfully. You know, this is the one that's worked better for me than anything. You know, I'll try to think of some interesting question about uh, something CRP, computer role-playing game related. You know, a question like, how many characters should should be in a party? Uh, should you just play, just have one character, or do you like to play uh, with three or four characters? You know, something like that. And then, uh, you know, get a couple hours later, there's like 30, 40 replies, and the people have replied to those replies. And, it, you know, it turns into this big discussion. Uh, just a simple question, really. Uh, it works out pretty well a lot of times, just to kind of get that ball rolling. And then, of course, you have to come back in and respond to the more interesting ones and like them all. I just, you know, I feel like I, I try to like or give a thumbs up to everybody if they unless they're just being ridiculous 
you know, I feel like just the act of participation, I want to <laughs> give you a thumbs up just for kind of stepping up and commenting. Uh, offer a top 10 list or five ways list. You know, those, those are popular. You know, the top 10. Here are my top 10 favorite uh, role-playing games. You know, it's almost guaranteed a hit. You know, people want to see that, even if it's just to say, oh, that's a stupid number, you know. Uh, that you should put so and so on your list, and I can't believe you included that on your list. You know, people love having those kind of discussions. Uh, five ways list. You know, five ways to overcome a uh, writer's block. Boom, <laughs> you know, instant audience. <laughs> uh, this is what I've always done: is interviewing experts. You know, so I just bring somebody on that has made games, and people love their games. They want to know who made the game. You know, so that they tune in for that. Uh, let's see, introduce, or you can think too, if you had a company, like let's say you work for one of the bike shops, you were consulting with them, you know, you could bring in some uh, recognized uh, cyclists, maybe you find some famous people and, and interview them, and a lot of people would tune in for that, right? Uh, introduce your leadership team to the broader audience. You can't quite see that one, <laughs> but it says the broader audience. All right, so again, just humanizing that corporation, that company. Uh, listening. Uh, so a lot of this is about, you know, what can we learn from the customers? We've got people here. They're engaging. Uh, we want to uh, learn from them so we can improve. Um, so I just wrote these questions out. And I'll have you answer these in a minute. But, you know, this is what you want to know, right? Like, what can I, what can we do better? Uh, Matt Chat. And let's just say my goal was to double, uh, <laughs> increase the size of Matt Chat. And so this is the, these are the questions I should be asking. Like, what can I do better? Or with these, uh, these lectures, you know, what, what would make this lecture better? Uh, you might have some ideas. Uh, what were your best experiences with us? Uh, so this is great because you don't, you know, a lot of the times uh, people feel like they don't need to say anything unless it's to complain, right? They, they get angry and they feel like they've been treated unfairly. So then they speak and then they get your attention. Uh, and then the people that were thought it was fine or liked it, you know, they just feel like uh, they don't need to say anything. You know, if it's okay, just, just don't speak. Uh, so you kind of have to draw that out uh, of people. Like, okay, uh, you've been coming here to this restaurant <laughs> for years. <laughs> there must be something you like about it, right? And once you know what those things are, uh, then you can capitalize it. You know, somebody's like, well, I just really love your... Uh, dessert pizzas. Well, once you find that out, that's like a common thing you can magnify and amplify on that. And then, of course, you know the flip side. So what was not so great? You know, maybe there's a, just one thing that's just driving people crazy and that would be easy to fix and you would, uh, you know, do a lot better. You know, one of the things that I find a lot of uh, uh, other people doing videos is they're like their audio will be too low. You know, real scratchy, you know, it's just really irritating. And you're like, you know, here's, <laughs> you could go to Walmart, uh, speaking of Walmart, you're like a $10 little clip on uh, webcam thing that'll make it sound a lot better than what, you know, that system you're currently using. And then finally, just kind of leaving in the blank or fill in the blank thing. What do you think of blank? You know, maybe you can make that for them to fill in or you could think about some different ideas. You know, what do you think about the, uh, the lectures, the color scheme, uh, the uh, the topic. Let's see, Carol gives us 10 tips on page 316 of, uh, oh yeah, I wasn't going to go over all these, all of these again. <laughs> now let's just take a quick look to see if there's anything that we haven't really touched on. <clears throat> let's see, using social media in a crisis, in crisis. So he's already talked about a lot of this stuff. You know, having the plan now, don't wait till the crisis to try to develop a plan. Have something in place before. Learn from costly, painful mistakes of those who have gone before. Uh, Volks, Tylenol, Volkswagen, CBS News, Chipotle, and there's no shortage of case studies. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it's one thing just to say, oh, look at Volkswagen. They sure screwed that, screwed that up. Ha ha. Uh, when you what you really should be doing is going in there and saying, how did they screw this up and what, what went wrong and how can I make sure we don't make this same mistake? You see, appoint a very visible spokesperson with real access up the ladder. Yeah, most of this, I'm just seeing if there's anything new here. 
<laughs> your worst possible response is silence. <laughs> you know, maybe, but, you know, I, I, would, I could make a case there's something to be said for just a, a cooling off period. You know, especially if you're highly emotional. So you leverage your mature social networks, patrol and monitor, acknowledge the damage, the hurt emotions, the inconvenience, stay active. And see so your fans and sometimes even your competitors will have your back if you've been honest, transparent, responsive, and human. All right, that's you know that's something we tend to forget about. You know, somebody has somebody posts something inflammatory or whatever, and you feel like you have to jump in and respond. And oh my goodness, you know everybody's going to uh, to hate me now. <laughs> uh, whereas really, if you've built up all these good relationships and you got lots of uh, friends and people that trust you, you know they'll they'll come to your defense. You know you can you can bank on that. <laughs> you know, it's, it's one reason to be a nice, friendly, ethical person. Okay, uh, thanks for watching this. And as promised, I want you to do answer. You don't have to answer all of these, but just uh, you know answer a few of these questions, at least one of these questions and. Uh, as you're doing it, you could even be thinking about your blog and how you might use these questions to learn more about your audience. But, uh, but yeah, what do you think could have been better here? Uh, what what did you like? Or uh, what were your best experiences with this lecture? A lot of people uh, have a favorite slide or a favorite uh, story. Uh, what were you? What was not so great? Uh, what do you think of this content and the delivery of this lecture? Uh, so just kind of as a sample, I tried to practice what I've been teaching here, put that in. Uh, but anyway, I do hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you have a great uh, rest of your day, and talk to you next time.